roll call. Okay. Roll call has been taken. Uh, the Economic Development Tourism and Cultural Initiatives Advisory Committee meeting is now called to order. Roll call has been taken. <clears throat> Prior to considering our, our items on the agenda, I will go over some rules of procedure. This meeting is held in a hybrid format in accordance with the electronic participation policy for virtual meetings. The full corporate policy 050 regarding electronic virtual meetings is available online to review. All cameras for committee members shall remain on to ensure quorum. Members of the committee shall indicate they wish to speak by physically raising their hand. Members who are present in person will be given opportunity to speak first, followed by virtual participants. Please leave your hand raised until the chair has determined the result of the vote. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaw apply. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Are there any uh, declarations of conflict of interest for any of the items listed on the agenda? Um, we have one presentation on our agenda today. I would ask Kevin McPhillips to come forward to present your presentation. Hey folks, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody or confirmation that folks can see the PowerPoint? Perfect, all right. Um, so thank you for having me here today um, to discuss the two different data reports that we've completed, the situational analysis and retail market analysis. Um, I know that I've been able to meet many of you either last week or um, a, about a month ago when we came for the airport folks group, but I just want to give a really brief introduction on who we are. So I'm here today representing our team at McSweeney and Associates. And we are community and economic development consultants who work with communities across Canada on a wide range of strategic projects. I myself, Kevin Phillips, Director of Research and Innovation at McSweeney and Associates, which really just means I handle a lot of the data work that we do. Um, and we take a lot of pride in not just working for a community, but really working with each of our partners. And it's important to us that you feel that passion for your community come through each of our projects. And so we hope that as you read these reports and the final strategy, you can see your community emboldened through that. And as partners, I do want to give a shout out right, right off the bat here to Kevin DeCock. Thank you so much for all the work you've done. Um, he's been a real asset as we built these uh, reports out and the, the data analysis out. And so just wanted to give um, some kudos to him for the support on this project. So with that um, you know, promotional spiel out of the way, uh, we can turn to why we're here, which is the reports. So over the next um, six to 10 minutes, I'm going to run through, you know, why we do a data assessment at the beginning of projects and then discuss both the situational analysis and retail analysis. I'm going to flag, um, this is going to be a very high level presentation. So some of you will have seen the data last week. Um, we do have some time at the end for questions, uh, but if anyone has specific questions that maybe we don't get around to addressing today, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're more than happy to chat about any of the data in the report. It's just given the time constraints, we're trying to do a really high level assessment to show some of what we were able to do. Uh, I will put contact information at the end of the presentation, so you will have that. And, and please truly don't hesitate to reach out. So why do a data assessment? These reports uh, kick off the broader seven year economic development strategy, and they're meant to complement the rest of the work we're doing. The situational analysis begins the project with a significant amount of data that supports the attraction of commercial and industrial businesses. On the flip side of that, our retail analysis presents an in-depth assessment of the current state of the local retail sector, sort of a bird's eye view, um, and, and then narrowing down into a more analytical approach to specifics on Brantford's retail, uh, retail sector. So the data we use, particularly within the situational analysis, has been identified as being of high importance to site selectors and potential investors. So the data really helps provide those who are interested in the community with a broad understanding of what the current situation is and within the broad or within the retail sector. Sorry. It should also be noted, data provides very useful context, but 
we of course understand local context matters an incredible amount as well. Data doesn't tell the whole story. And that's why in concert with these reports, we've been doing a whole host of focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews and had an online survey up to really hear from folks on the ground about local context. So regarding our situational analysis, we begin with a demographic analysis of Brantford, things like quality of life, housing structures, incomes for people who live in Brantford. And then we move to a labor force profile and analysis. You'll see the profile and analysis includes the surrounding area. That's really standard because labor is obviously not limited to geographical borders. You can cross a municipal border, absolutely no problem to go to work. And so when somebody's interested in your community, they're not just interested in the labor pool that exists within Brantford, but also the area that they can attract from outside the community. Then we look at what's called an economic base analysis which provides industry employment totals and business and sector data for those businesses and jobs specifically within Brantford. So that's gonna be business count, export data, total jobs, and that sort of analysis. So really quickly, some of the things we found, first and foremost, I don't think I have to explain this to anybody, Brantford's population is growing leaps and bounds. 10 years ago or 11, 12 years ago now, it was 90,000. In the 2021 census, it was over 100,000. And by 2032, it's projected to rise above 120,000. This is an entirely unique phenomenon. It's happening across Ontario, but it's unique in terms of um, historical figures. And it's something that brings with it many challenges and opportunities. That growth is coming. There are challenges, but there are also some really unique opportunities to grow Brantford in a way that benefits the community. Another thing we found, again, apologies to people who were there last week. Uh, you will be seeing a lot of the same data but occupied dwellings by structure type. Brantford has a really good mix, generally speaking, of dwelling structures. There are 60% or just over 60% single detached houses and almost a quarter of the dwelling structures are apartments. You will see that it's below Ontario. That's expected given Toronto has such a high level of apartments and such a large impact on the data. But generally speaking, compared to other municipalities of similar population size, this is a pretty good breakdown. Um, you can certainly try to attain more row houses, semi-detached apartment and detached duplexes, as it does provide opportunities for people with different socioeconomic backgrounds. But generally, this would be a pretty positive indicator. Lastly, is business counts by size. I, I love flagging this one because typically when people think economic development, they, they think of the historical model of chasing smokestacks, chasing those massive you know, Volkswagen plants to your community. Those are great, no doubt, and Brantford has some really strong anchor tenants, but that one to nine employee range and the indeterminate, which is sort of your individual who's self-employed, doesn't have any staff, that represents the vast majority of businesses, close to 90% of businesses in Brantford. And so that's a huge driver for the local economy and a really big positive. So don't forget those small businesses as you consider economic development. Turning now to the retail market analysis, we broke it into four sections, starting with supply side analysis. So looking at jobs, industry outputs and business counts. Demand side analysis was next, looking at Brantford demographics and spending patterns. And then we looked at retail sector trends at a provincial and national level and future projections again at a provincial and national level. So what did we find? Um, I, I'm not gonna get into the specific clusters here or what they mean, again, Highly encourage you to read the report, reach out if you have any questions, but just wanted to note, um, we were able to build a profile of demographic groups through our third party data supplier. And we were able to highlight which of these groups were quite prevalent in Brantford. And then within the report, we were able to showcase those typical spending patterns. As you can see, the top three groups here, so high trades, which are trades people, nest builders, which just is a, is a certain classification of folks looking to buy their first home, and then new Canadians represent a larger percentage of the population in Brantford compared to Ontario and Canada. This data really isn't prescriptive. It doesn't mean this is who should be attracted to Brantford or that these trends are going to stay the same way. It's just a valuable picture of the current demographic trend in Brantford. And then finally, uh, I personally find this one really valuable and interesting. What we have here is e-commerce as a percentage of national retail sales. We can't get this data at a level better than national. It's just Statistics Canada data but it is still very valuable. As you can see, rates spiked in e-commerce sales 
uh, during the pandemic, but they've dropped considerably since and are sitting at slightly above 5%. Before the pandemic, it was approximately 3.9%. So it's risen a percent to a percent and a half over the last couple of years. This doesn't mean e-commerce isn't impactful. Uh, you know, shoppers do a lot of research online and engage with businesses online. But when considering pieces like your downtown revitalization or general shopping trends within the retail sector, it's really important to assume or to not assume that e-commerce is this behemoth that's coming to take all the shopping habits. It's a factor, uh, and certainly COVID played a part in speeding up its rise, and it is likely to continue rising over the coming years. But even still, right now, it's responsible for about a dollar out of every $20 spent on retail. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. Brick and mortar stores need to adapt, but they're not going away anytime soon. And so don't count them out when you're considering things like a downtown revitalization. So again, this is just a really high level overview of the two reports. Uh, there's a ton of data in there, more than happy to answer any questions on it, either now or in the future, um, but just really wanted to kind of give an overview of what we did and hopefully um, spark some interest in the other reports. So with that, I, I open the floor to any questions um, about the report and I'll give everybody about 15 seconds to write down the email if they want and then stop sharing. Thank you, Kevin, for that presentation. Are there any questions of the uh, consultant regarding the presentation? Question for the question. I know at 545, data questions aren't exactly on everybody's mind. <laughs> um, you can stay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, thanks. So, Kevin, if you can just stick around because once we put the report on the floor, there might be some there questions, questions for you. That's right. Sure. Thank you for that. We'll now consider item 4.1. Um, can I please have a mover and seconder to place the item on the floor? Anna? Okay. Anna, excellent. Um, any discussion? Yes. Uh, uh, Chair, I've got a question for um, our consultant. So there's a ton of data here, and it's hard as an elected official to know how to digest it and um, condense it into some themes or thoughts or actions that an elected official might consider. So I'm looking for your advice. As an elected official looking at this report, being concerned about uh, the economic future of our community and making sure that uh, we're as prosperous as possible with as many uh, different kinds of economic opportunities uh, as possible. What, what should I gather from this and how should it impact my decision making going forward? Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So the the purpose of these documents is, I would say, to exist behind the scenes for the most part. So if I can give a little spiel. So typically, these documents are designed to be, especially the situational analysis, handed to potential investors who are interested in the community. And so what we always suggest repeatedly is these documents are not prescriptive. The data doesn't say you have to do one thing or the other. It's just, this is the reality about a community and it's really valuable to an economic development department in that regard. And so as an elected official, if you're looking to make use of these documents, I think the best way to do so would be to turn it back to staff and ask for an assessment of what within the local context is eligible to be pulled out and actioned because that's really not something that we do given we don't have that local context and any given piece of data can be manipulated to uh, assess one situation or another. And so in terms of actionable items from a public facing standpoint, we focus more on the end stages of the report. So that final strategic plan and the actions and implementation plan coming out of that. These documents from our end are more background valuable information for an ECDEV department. And then if you want to action anything off of that, it would be 
most valuable to have staff sort of take that and provide a, an assessment of it with that angle to it. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Mayor. Acting on that advice. Um, so we do have this resolution in front of us, right? Which is to receive it and comments. Any comments we might make? Between associates will incorporate our final analysis. Maybe we should have a C. We're going to propose an amendment. Um, so my amendment is we add C. C would read that staff be requested or staff be directed to uh, provide a report back to this committee on what items should be what ends or actions should be initiated based on the data contained in this report? Yep. <laughs> and I don't have the one. The one thing I would yeah. I would um, consider, and I, I don't want to speak at a turn or anything, but there will be actions coming out of this project as a whole down the line, and so it's possible that, that you it's jumping the gun a bit. Now it, it sort of depends on what you're looking for here, but I think this is a step in the process. So I, I do think there might be a bit of jumping the gun, but that's, I, I mean, I don't know my yes. role here, so I probably shouldn't have even so said it. From anything. your perspective, which you see this as, this is your first go around with us. And what you're really looking for tonight, I assume is comments from us that you might include in your final report. I got that straight. This is really, yeah. my being here is more of an informational piece. So yeah, we're looking for, is there any comments about the data, any clarification piece that, that you folks might have or anything of that nature, um, having read the report that you wanted to, to flush out, happy to do that. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of the actions, I really wouldn't try to draw any from this stage because I think they will be coming out down the line. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I'll, re I'll retract that amendment. Um, but it's, I think it's served a purpose that uh, staff are notified that luckily yeah. that's what will come down the line. Okay. Anna? And with regards to that, I mean, I would think that the outputs of this report would, um, like, with, you have a priorities list, right? Mm -hmm. So I would think it would probably be more efficient if staff could look at here are the priorities list. Here's how this data set, you know, enhances or um, coincides with the priorities, and whether there's any any items there that don't mesh well, right? If your priority is this, but your data set says something completely different. Then maybe the priorities have to be reevaluated, or et cetera, et cetera. I think that would probably be a more um, efficient way to do it, right? Because you already have your priorities, so the data can provide more information about that. I think just a suggestion. Thank you for that. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Dan. My question is uh, to the industrial sector. Is it uh, broken down to the small scale and the large scale manufacturing? So we can focus on whether we have to focus on the small scale or the large scale industry. Is it separated? How many people are employed by the small scale, which is less than 10 employees? Unfortunately, unfortunately, that data comes from different data sources. So the Canadian B Business Registry uh, presents data on the number of businesses by size in Brantford, and then a completely different data source provides export data and job total data. So they don't they don't break it down by business size, unfortunately. Uh, 
so there's no real way to do that um, and that's just sort of a reality of the data that that we have councillor hunt has a hand up Yeah, so um, through the chair to, to Kevin, so this specifically speaks to um, being a situational analysis and a retail analysis, which I think is going to Mr. Um, Panag's question as well, is um, are we expected to see further reports that are like beyond the retail sector? So um before the the final uh, like i I'm, i mean the re this report that we're looking at now is 123 pages long and you know i'm um i'm scanning through it and i'm i'm thinking from even from a staff's perspective um is is the data that we're going to get based on say an industrial analysis or um, because you did address small businesses, but I mean, there are a lot of small businesses that are in the industrial sector, for example. So is that, is that another report, another data report that's going to feed into the final report? So specifically for this project, we were hired to do the situational analysis, which is the broad overview, and then a specific retail sector report um, that sector was identified as being of importance and so we focused on those two analyses um if there was interest in doing additional reporting on different sectors that's something that is feasible um in terms of like that can be done but we we haven't been hired to do that so it would likely need to go back out for a proposal um in order to be done that's not part of the scope of our project here Okay, so then feeding into that, um, as a somebody that participated um, in a very lengthy discussion with, uh, as a stakeholder, um, both as a counselor and also a, a business owner, um, my input would not have been from a retail perspective. So I, I certainly got the sense that the economic development strategy was gonna be looking at, at a lot more than just um, the retail analysis. So yeah, absolutely. Or, or so is, I, that, is that data coming, as you said, from another source, not specifically from, from, from something that you're doing? Yeah, so I guess, the, I'm trying to think of how to go about this. So the, the project process involves the data at the front when we do these strategies, the situational analysis is really the backbone of the data that's relevant to the final strategy. That's that's our typical data report that we do at the beginning of just about every strategy, unless a community specifically says we don't want that. Um, the retail analysis was a separate piece that si the city put in the proposal. They really wanted to assess this. Um, sector specifically to have an understanding of where the retail sector is going coming out of COVID-19. So that's, that doesn't mean that that's going to be a specific part of the final strategy. It doesn't mean we're going down that road at all. It's just that that was an addendum to the proposal that was really important to the city. So that's why it was included here. But the situational analysis is really the document that lays the groundwork for that initial assessment. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I get I get the demographic portion and, and, and that, but yeah, I guess, I guess it was, I was wondering if we were looking at more uh data reports based on different industries other than just retail but i understand if that and sorry to put you on the spot that might no, have been a better question for staff no um, that, in terms totally of yeah yeah. Um, yeah so that from a consultant standpoint that's outside the scope of what we were hired to do but yeah. the, the data does exist um it, it it is gettable if the city wants that and wants to go down the road of putting something out to tender that that certainly is possible it's just a question of um you know at the end of the day it's it's the why behind okay so you have the data now what um why is it particularly valuable um it's just making sure that for the investment that it would be to to put those reports together do you have a specific why where you'll see a return on that investment or whatever else all right thanks for that 
absolutely. <clears throat> Any other questions from the floor? Okay. I can ask one more question. Go ahead. To the chair, uh, Madam, how many uh, years old is this data? Like when this data started to be collected and how old is it right now? Is it a year old, two years old, it took three years? Yeah, so um, this is the, the bread and butter of why we love um, our data. So this data is the most accurate or most up-to-date data you'll find. So there's a combination of, of answers. The MZ analyst data was 2022 quarter three. So the, the second half of 2022, that's um, as really as fresh a data as you can possibly get. They had just updated it um, within a month. So the, 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 or within a month, I think of when we started, um, and so obviously that data will lag a little bit on their end because they have to accumulate it all, but that's as, as fresh as possible. Now, one of the pieces, so if you look at the export data and some of the business analysis stuff, that's from, I think it's 2019, for whatever reason, that's the most accurate data available at an industry level. Uh, and so the MZ analyst data is three years behind. The Statistics Canada data, which is really only used for population and demographic stuff, the census data is from 2021. There are significant issues with that census data uh, that they make note of because it was right in the middle of one of the really bad stretches of the pandemic. And so there's just some challenges there that there's no workaround for. It's just a reality of data accumulation. Um, and so that's a challenge. And then finally, the manifold data. So the super demographic data, um, that is 2022 data. So it's more up to date than Statistics Canada. The other thing to note on that data, which is noted in the report is manifold data is more accurate than Statistics Canada data. Statistics Canada data uses, they pull as many people as they can, and then they try to extrapolate that to reasonable estimates based on the number of people who respond to a survey. However, not everybody responds to the census. There's no forcing you to do so. And so Statistics Canada admits that they're totally upfront about it. This isn't hidden or anything like that. It's just Statistics Canada census data doesn't profile everybody in the country and they have ways to adjust to that, but there are still challenges with that, especially when you consider the people who don't respond. Uh, folks from lower socioeconomic demographics and indigenous partners are very hesitant to respond to government surveys. And so they are frequently uh, undercounted on these surveys. Our private data supplier, Manifold, has more accurate ways of getting information. They have private access to not nefarious uses, but credit card information um, at an amalgamated level. And so they can scrape a lot more accurately uh, demographic data than Statistics Canada, just because they have access to more comprehensive private sources. So the data that you have in front of you in this report, it's very, very accurate relative to Statistics Canada data, and it's more up to date as best we can. Um, so you can you can rest assured that it is, it is very up to date data, or at least as up to date as the data can get. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to, uh, to Kevin, just a question about the population um, of Brantford trending um, it seems that we're trending, we're trending above the provincial average, and we see you trending below the provincial average coming into 2032. Is that a trend we should be concerned about, or maybe you can't comment on concern, but is would you consider that to be close enough to the provincial average, or is this something we should monitor and, and yeah, be aware of? That's a really good question. Um, I... I, I mean, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, I, I love numbers, but at the end of the day, I, I really strongly suggest not trying to take a specific lesson out of any one number. Um, as you said, I mean, the, the jump from 2016 to 2021 was massive. It's like double the provincial average, and then you're, you're just below the provincial mark. There are so many different factors that impact that number, including other projections suggest Brantford is going to grow more quickly and projections are I mean I, I really like projections they're really useful but there there's a mar there's a really considerable margin of error there um, 
And, and so uh, first off, I think don't worry about it in terms of comparing it to the provincial average, because as you say, you're close enough within that margin of error. There's no harm, no foul there at all. But then the other thing is, uh, I, I wouldn't stress about comparing it to the last five years, the 2016 to 2021, because it's such a unique period that it could continue, um, but it, it, it could also shift rapidly, especially, you know, things right now are so dependent on housing starts and everything else that um, projections could flip overnight. If a huge new subdivision comes in, that's going to jump a population, or if, you know, there's an increase in partnership with one of the post-secondary institutions that will change things. So it's a, it, I find the population is a very valuable metric to understand how population growth is going to affect a community. If your numbers are, you know, projected to increase by zero, then you know you're where you are. But if with this projection, it, it's useful to be ready for that growth and to know that growth is coming, but whether it's 3% or 7%, um, I think a projection is just a valuable indicator, but I wouldn't try to shape anything directly to that 5% number. Uh, if that sort of, I'm hoping that answers the question. Uh, thank you. One more question. To the chair, to Kevin. Is the, uh, the population growth, uh, service industry is growing as well is that uh, separated from the commercial side and industrial do you have any projections on that um so when you say separated do you mind are you able to give more context on that the what data is it separated when you do the revenue from those vectors is there a table you're specifically referring to there by any chance uh, I have to go through it, but let's just talk about the service industry, which is growing rapidly because of the population growth. Yeah, so, okay, so I, I, I'm going to try and ask the question and then if I go off, let me know. So one of the things we talk about is, is labor force investment attraction. And so there are different sectors that rely on different forms of attraction. There are your provincial sectors, like a hospital, you don't just go out and attract a bunch of nurses and then create a hospital. That's not how that works. Hospital is built by the province and then nurses are attracted to it, typically that sort of thing. So there's public sector and public sector industries are attracted by provincial or federal government. There are population based growth industries. And so that's your things like your service sector, your residential construction. If you went out and attracted a whole bunch of home builders or retail folks, they can't just create something out of nothing. There has to be that population growth demand. And so as your population grows, there will be natural growth expected in residential construction in uh, the service sector. And then there's your more targeted investment sector growth. So just because your population grows doesn't mean you're going to poof, have a new manufacturer. That's not how that works. That's how it works in those population growth sectors. But if you want to attract a certain sector, whether it's wholesale industry or manufacturing or whatever else, you have to have a more targeted investment strategy um, for that. And that's especially where that economic development team comes in. Um, and, and so that's the growth is going to be more natural for things like services and it's going to be more targeted for your businesses that rely on non-growth factors so your manufacturing your construction that's non-residential that sort of thing i'm hoping that answers your question um, but if it doesn't let me know thank you absolutely thank you. this is fantastic we usually don't get much engagement on data so this is wonderful <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Seeing no further questions, um, I make a motion to pass item four. I think Gary has a question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. There is a question. Where do you see that? Okay. Hi, Gary, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just 
skimmed through the report as well. I'm just wondering, is there any data specific to the downtown in here or somewhere in here we can pull it from? So, no. Yeah, as a straightforward answer, unfortunately, the, the, it, we can't get that um, specific with the data. Um, there are a few workarounds, but um, no, uh, unfortunately not. Is there going to be a focus on the downtown at some point? And I don't want to speak out region. of turn with respect to the pro. I don't want to put my colleagues under the bus at all. Um, <laughs> however, I will say that through all of our consultations, downtown has been something that's been repeatedly mentioned. And so, so a, a quick overview of the process, just for those who don't know. So we've done focus groups, we've done one-on-one -on -one consultations, we've had the online survey. We're going to be taking all of the themes that came out of those consultations and then starting to narrow down into some of the actions um, that will make sense. And we'll be working with staff to narrow that down. Um, I, it would be quite an upset if downtown wasn't in there. Again, I don't want to speak out of turn and put my colleagues in a, in a tough place, but um, that is a major theme that has arisen through the consultations. And so it's not something that's going to be overlooked for sure. Okay. Will you be meeting with the BIA as part of your process? So we work with staff to, um, well, staff essentially provide us with a list of folks who are, who we are speaking with. Uh, we have spoken to at least one representative from the BIA, I believe two or three though, um, at different points of the project already. And it, I mean, obviously the BIA is quite an integral partner. And so um, again, it, it's more up to staff than it is us who we speak to down the road, but we have previously worked with the BIA um, during the project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Okay. Um, I make a motion to pass item 4.1. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing no opposition, the motion carries. Now we move on to 4.2. Uh, Subcommittee and working group background and appointments. Can I please have a mover and seconder to place the item on the floor? Mover, Mandy, seconder. Okay. Now the item is on the floor. Any discussion? <laughs> A says that report um, 2023 to, no, no, okay, sorry, 2023 347 title subcommittee and working group background and appointments be received. And sorry. B. Sorry to interrupt. I just, am I needed still or I'm sorry? Are you, oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> You're good to go, Kevin. Thank awesome. you, Kevin. Thanks so much. Thanks Have a great you. night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is like that someone mm -hmm. be appointed to the public art working group and that a culture and build heritage funding subcommittee be created as an official subcommittee of the Economic Development, Tourism and Culture Initiatives Advisory Committee, consisting of the following members. Um, so we would need to find these members. And that the mandate of the funding subcommittee be to review all the application materials and to utilize the program eligibility criteria and rating criteria to propose the grant allocations to eligible not-for-profit organizations and to make a recommendation with respect to the proposed grant to the Economic Development, Tourism and Culture Initiatives Advisory Committee and ultimately to, to Committee of the Whole. So can... Does anybody want to be appointed to the public art working group? 
sorry, just, just in case you didn't hear, um, would anybody like to nominate themselves or someone else to be appointed to the public art working group? group? I have a question. Sure, Peter. Um, so uh, can you kind of give, can staff maybe give a background to uh, what the public work art working group is and, uh, and what's required of them? Sure, thank you. I can speak to that uh, through the chair to you, Peter. Uh, the public art working group is not a group that meets regularly. So it's at the call of the chair, often if there's a public art initiative that is led by staff. So typically what we do when we have a public art project, uh, we pull from our public art reserve fund. And in order to do so, we need approval from the public art working group, uh, formerly known as public art subcommittee. Um, so we would write a proposal, do a presentation, if the public art working group approves that proposal, it would then go to committee of the whole and council. So the role of this would be in an advisory capacity to say whether or not this is um, a, a cultural project or art project that enhances the beautification of the city um, and ultimately decides that this is a project we should go ahead and pursue. And if it's worth pulling out of our public art reserve fund. Thank you Thank for you. the explanation. Yes. Through the chair, can I nominate someone? Sure. Uh, Victor Kalinsky. Victor, do you smile? Accept the nomination. I was gonna. I was gonna nominate Anna. <laughs> 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 um, Sure, yeah, only because I think that Anna, um, being the director of Glenhurst, I think probably will run into conflicts of interest, yeah. um, considering, uh, you know, often Glenhurst is involved in these public art uh, projects, and I'm not a Glenhurst employee or staff member or anything. So yeah, I will, I'll, I'll gladly accept the nomination unless somebody else wants to, I'm vice chair of this committee. So I'm, uh, you know, if somebody else wants to do that, maybe Peter, if you spoke up, maybe if you wanted to do that, um, I'm happy to see that um, appointment or that nomination. No, I think I probably have some conflicts of interest. So, yeah, I think Vic, Victor, you're probably a good choice. Sounds great. Awesome. Thank you, Victor. Uh, how about um, one, two, three, four, five? We need five people to sit on the subcommittee. <clears throat> yeah, the Culture and Build Heritage Funding Subcommittee. Nominations. Yes. Or questions through the chair. Can I, do I, can I ask a question? Yes. Do we know what the funding, what available funding is available or what's available? For what's available yet? Uh, through the chair, to you, Anna, we don't know at this time. This was pulled from the casino legacy fund, which was suspended in 2020 because of COVID. So that fund has to be reinactivated. And then once it is, uh, we'll have a better sense of how much money we have. Mm -hmm. Historically, um, so this is usually for capital projects just to provide a little extra context for cultural organizations. So in the last seven years since the program started, we typically have anywhere from one to three applicants a year. It's an annual intake. It's just once in the summer. Um, you know, big, large scale projects, most recently the Canadian Military Heritage Museum had an accessible washer, for example. Through the chair to Kara, is there, um, does the criteria remain the same? Is there any changes to the criteria for this particular? No, through the chair, the, the requirements are the exact same. So the minimum eligibility request is $20,000. So we won't entertain requests less than $20,000. There is no maximum, uh, but there's two streams. One is emergency funding and one is project funding. And the city will, will uh, allocate up to 50% of that project. So it's, it's a matching either by the organization or by other grant sources. There's a question online. Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, go ahead. Would help uh, if I wasn't happy. muted. Um, I don't have a question. I'm uh, I'm interested in serving on that committee. I don't know if we're doing nominations yet or not. Yes, we are. Thank you, Stephanie. Any else? other nominations? Do we need five? We need at least three. I would be uh, willing to sit on that committee. Peter. Okay. I'm not willing to sit on it, but 
I would emphasize this is important. Uh, through COVID, <clears throat> the revenue coming to us from the casino dropped from about 5.5 million a year down to down to one. You know, and so there was a lot of there were a lot of programs that were just simply tapped and stopped because the money wasn't there. But uh, the money has begun to flow again, uh, probably around five million dollars a year. So. Uh, there could be a significant uh, sum allocated towards this purpose. And so the input of this particular subcommittee could be of some uh, uh, real importance to the city and, and as it decides and council decides what to do with the money coming in from the casino. Thank you, Mayor. So it's a significant subcommittee and I think it'd be well worth serving. I would love to sit on. NJ. Great. So we have four. Mm -hmm. Oh, for my neighbor. Okay. All five. We got there. Excellent. Um, this ends that then. Um, <laughs> no discussion. Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion at all? No, it's not Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Those opposed? None, motion carries. All right. Um, now moving on to item 5.1. Can I please have a mover and seconder to place the minutes on the floor? Ray, I saw your hand first, uh, and Jane. Thank you. Any discussion? No discussion. Um, then all those in favor? Those opposed? Okay, Victor lowered his hand on time. Great. Uh, and the motion carries. There are no resolutions. And there is one notice of motion on the agenda. Nina, please read the title of your notice of motion. Parquet to honor Juan Harris. Yes. Just need the title. <laughs> okay. 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 Excellent. Um, that's it. The meeting is now adjourned. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm yes. still learning this. Uh, so thank you all for your support. And just to recap, the next meeting is June 21st. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Same time.